Awesome. Alex, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you very much, Berg. Awesome. Well, I know you're based in Tel Aviv, but you were just telling me how you let, you know travel quite a bit, London, New York City, you had an international kind of background. Would you be able to give us like a very quick intro of like, kind of like, you know, those early years, what you've done, the coolest things, and then now what you do? Sure. So I'm not a typical uh, venture capitalist. Um, I grew up as a psychologist and uh, my specific expertise, it's behavioral economics, how people make decisions. Um, and uh, for many years, and actually I'm still maintaining some consultancy, consultancy, I was helping companies, corporate governments to make smart decisions and to build products that will fit irrational humans. Uh, I was honored to help in the beginning of the COVID outbreak with convincing Israelis to put masks and take shots and uh, help some big tech companies to build better apps and better printers and phones. And with, uh, through the years, I have generated a deal flow of companies without realizing it, that it's a deal flow, just just by helping them. And on the other hand, I had also investors as clients. So at a certain point, investments started to flow over my consultancy. And we decided to establish a proper investment activity instead of doing matchmaking. So that's how we get here. That's absolutely amazing. The first question I want to ask you is, you've lived in Europe, specifically Eastern Europe, Latvia. That's kind of where you spent a lot of your childhood. You've now been in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. You've been to London. You've been to New York City. If you're a young person today and you're thinking about, you know, I want to build a company and I want to fundraise and I want to make it big, what city would you strategically position yourself in to get there? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure that... I can differentiate specific city among those you just mentioned, but I definitely can tell you, get yourself to the city. We just spoke about it just a few minutes before. One of the main drives of the innovation, it's the density of people and those people that are minded like you and they think about innovation and changing the world. So there are many, many cones in the cities, but there is at least one pro, which is density of ideas and people. So Tel Aviv, New York, a bit different, but also uh, the valley is a bit, uh, it's, it's not the best days of the valley. Um, London, also good place. Again, it's a bit different. So it depends where you feel comfortable, but definitely big city. Big city, that's, yeah. I, I think when I was talking to some of my Israeli colleagues, you know, they're building startups out of Israel. They're telling me that alongside San Francisco, Tel Aviv specifically is one of the highest density of unicorns. Is that is that true? I mean, I, I haven't really looked into numbers, but, you know, from that's what they're true. telling me. That's yeah. true. Uh, they just released the Startup Nation Central, which is a research company. They just released their uh, second half of 2024 research. And Israel is leading, it's the leader in the world, Israel, as country, in the percentage of the R&D spend compared to the GDP. Uh, Israel is in third or fourth uh, in the density of unicorns. Uh, it used to be first, but because of the war, because of the political situation here, so we now in the fourth position. Uh, Tel Aviv is always the second or the third in the density of uh, founders backed by VC. So not just ideas. They passed the angel stage and they managed to get seed funding. Um, and Tel Aviv University, uh, alongside at the Technion in the Hifa, always in the first, second, third places in the amount of founders that grew up from there. So there is something in the air here that helps drive innovation. That's incredible. 
when before we start recording, you're talking about how you got a lot of, re, you know, you got rejected by investors quite a few times when you were a younger man. Let's talk about those experiences. What were you fundraising for? And what did you learn from that process of going from investor to investor and getting rejected? I was a part of a couple of startups. Um, and I think one of the main lessons I learned that you're going to hear hundreds of no, and it's not because of you. It's not because of you. It's not because you failed. It's not because you're doing a bad job. You may do a bad job, but not necessary. And most of the no's won't be because of you. It's because the, the, the investor is uh, busy with something else, because your email got lost in their CRM, which happens a lot, used to happen a lot. Uh, because your uh, product is too young, too old. There are so many reasons. So don't take it personally. It's not about you. It's about the combination of the right timing with the right investor in the right place. And it will happen if you get better and better. But it's not always about you. One of the interesting things you said is you have to get the timing right. So you have to make sure that the the VC, the investors that you're approaching, they're willing to fund a product in that is around the stage you're at. And what I find interesting is that, it, like you said, a lot of founders, when they get rejected, it's not because they suck or their product sucks, but it's that it, there's just misalignment in terms of the VC, you know, the stage they invest in, the kind of products they invest in, the verticals they choose to invest in. If you were going about starting that journey today, how would you go about researching and identifying the right investors? So one, you can minimize the amount of hours you're wasting on reaching out to investors that aren't going to fund you. And then second is how do you like increase those odds of getting funded by really just only doing these, this kind of outreach to only relevant investors? So there are two dimensions here. The first one is actually not wasting your time and in the investor time uh, approaching with the wrong product for the wrong investor. I will, we will get to it in a minute. But even more important dimension, it's the message that it sends to the investor when you are not aligned. You should do your homework and you should know about the investor and their portfolio, etc. Not because they are more important, no at all. Just because then you can be aligned with their goals, with their strategy. So if you didn't came with come, come with with a uh, homework and and you don't you can't show the investor that you actually understand his strategy and what he's in, interested in it's a bad signal i mean i i, I never uh, i never met a good exceptional founder who, who who was not doing his homework or her homework so that's even more important than the alignment itself and that, uh, on the more technical note, uh, today there are really great tools that uh, segment investors uh, and help you to narrow down the industry that you are in. Don't say AI, find something else, even if you use AI. Um, the stage you company at. So there's a precedent when you usually get friends, family, so maybe angels, then seed, maybe angels, maybe young funds, like early, early stage funds, and then post seed usually. It depends if it's deep tech, not deep tech. So there is another uh, stop there. And then A, which is bigger checks, and different investors usually do different stages. So the right vertical, the right stage, uh, the right flavor. Usually, you can see by the portfolio what's the flavor that investors like. So, for instance, in my portfolio, you will see that we invest in, in people. We don't invest in the product. We don't invest in the market. We don't invest in the IP. We invest in, in, in the founders. So, and you can see it when you, when you just go through the portfolio that those are very, very strong and, and, and uh, outstanding founders. So... There are great tools today. Just do your homework. It, it will help you not to waste your time. 
and to provide a good signal to the investor that you are meeting. So let's get real tactical. You've met with one of your, before you've invested, you meet with one of your portfolio companies and they've done a bit of research. They know, okay, Alex likes to invest in people. So go into this meeting, I'm going to show them I've done my homework by talking about myself a little bit more and how I'm exceptional and why he should invest in me rather than this company. Is that one of the ways they can show they've done their homework? And then what are some other ways when you sat across founders, they showed you that they were prepared and they had done their research that made you say, that made you say, you know what, this, this person I'm going to invest in. Wonderful. So uh, it's a great question. And if, and if you're going to cut all our one li liner from our conversation, I think it should be the following. Listen to your investors. They will listen to you, but it's also very important to listen to them. Ask them questions. Uh, be curious about. Uh, on the psychological level, it creates the right atmosphere uh, for trust and for, for uh, right communication. So that's like an overall idea. Uh, more specifically, the all startup decks looks the same. I mean, it's, it's, if your deck doesn't look typically, he's probably bad because it's very hard to, to, to push the whole idea and technology into 8, 10, 12 slides. So you have to assume that your deck won't affect dramatically nothing in the meeting, uh, part of being information. So the main import, the, the most important part of the pitch will be you or your team or whoever are speaking there um so don't don't be too focused on yourself but make sure that you are taking responsibility that you are showing that you get things done uh that you overcome crises and challenges uh, those are the traits that investors are looking for in the founders. Okay. I want to break that down. So you mentioned two things. One is really listen and ask your investors questions. And the second is really understand that your deck isn't as important as you think it is because all decks are pretty much the same anyway. And it's very difficult to fit all the nuances of a company and why it's going to work into uh, you know eight or 10 pages. And if it's above 10 pages, no one's reading it anyway, to its full extent. So I want to, the, the first thing I want to ask you is, what are the questions you're referring to? So if I'm sitting across the table or across, you know, this kind of meeting with you, what questions should I ask you as an investor to really understand you and understand the kind of investments you make that also make you go, you know what, this, this person, you know, they're curious, they're asking the right questions. Yeah. Again, a great question. Uh, speaking of questions, um, so there are general things that will help you anyway, so it's worth asking, like, uh, do you actively investing now and what you are looking for to diversify your portfolio? Because investors always look to diversify the portfolio, even if they invest in specific vertical, but there are nuances. So that's the technical question. The other questions you may uh, use, it's about the experience, taking advice from the investor. It, it, you, can, you can be pitching to the investor and still you can ask in specific aspects. On here, actually, I would, like, I would love to have your advice because we had experience like this and had experience like this. And what, what would you suggest? And which is fine. Uh, most of the times it will sound right. Uh, and again, there are tons of research that those who listen more sell more. Even for salesmen, those who are doing sales for living, which is counterintuitive, right? Because usually we, we, we imagine like a wolf, wolf from the Wall Street that never stops speaking, talking. Uh, and apparently, no. Apparently, those salesmen who listen to their clients, they sell more. And uh, in a way, in a sense, you are a salesman when you are pitching. 
So just show, be sensitive to the signals from the table. And you can say, I can see that something bothers you. What is it? Can I answer a question? Something like that. Mm -hmm. So I've had this in, in pitch meetings myself where an investor, you know, you'll be walking them through who you are and your product. And then they'll, they'll say something like, oh, well, how is this going to work? And they start digging deeper into some. And at, at points like those is like you said, and just to kind of like really understand what you're saying here. At, at point like those is where you can say, oh, you know what? Actually, that's something we'd love your advice on. We, we actually do want to figure this out. What do you think we should do? What, what would you say, you know, should be our course of action here? We've tried this, this, this. And to your point, that's going to make them feel comfortable, right? That's going to make them feel like you're actually willing to listen and you're coachable to an extent and they're going to feel more comfortable. Yeah, that's right. Uh, most of the investors will ask questions in, in the middle of your presentation or by the end of the presentation. Uh, those questions sometimes uh, are about technical things. Most of the time they are just to get to know you better um, if they are interested in the startup because very quickly the investor will realize if it's something that he should spend more time on and figure out is it actually interesting or no, it's not for me for, for, for various reasons. Because now we are not looking for such startups or because I don't like the, the, the founder. Uh, but once he decided that it's worth another discovery, so he will ask questions and he can use those questions, first of all, to show how you're excited about the, your product, how you're excited about your solution, and to give some details that shows that you are a domain professional in your specific domain. And on, our, on the other hand, it allows you to actually develop a conversation with the investor and to ask his for, for him for advice or her for advice, um, to share a story, anecdote, and to ask, did he experience anything similar? Uh, it, it's a great move as long as you are honest, as long as you are not playing. Absolutely. And then the second part I want to ask you about is you talked about founders. So actually one of the things you referred to in even your answer now was they may not invest just because they don't like the founder. The business model could be as good, but if the founder is you know, a bit of an a-hole or they're just not, you know, they just don't take the time to build that relationship, you know, the investor that may, that may be a massive turn on turn off. So if I'm sitting across you and you're, you know, I'm pitching you and I'm talking to you, what are some things I can do as a founder to really get you to one, feel comfortable with me, especially as a psychologist. So I like, what are some maybe psychology principles I can use to like get you to feel comfortable with me, get you to trust me. And then what are some just very tactically things I can say about myself? And like, cause I think one of the things is what, what to say. One of the problems is like, Founders don't know what to say about themselves because there's so much to cover in such little time. So what should you prioritize? Is it like you said, talking about those challenges you've had and how you've overcome them? And, you know, what kind of points should I hit as when I'm talking about myself? Um, so there, there is a whole field of, of uh, psychology of selling or psychology of, of uh, negotiation. And it's, it's a, in a sense, it's a, a negotiation. Uh, so you have to be, you don't have to be nothing, but it will help you um, if you are confident. And when I'm saying confident, I don't mean speaking confidently or not being stressed because you are pitching. Confident about the story, confident about your uh, skill sets and knowledge, confident about your research, that you that people can see that you are confident in the topic. You feel comfortable there. So this is a very important because it, it lays down like ground for, for more effects. Uh, again, to listen to the other side, very important. I cannot exaggerate how important it is. Um, I think what's the, like the most important things, because there are many, um, show that you should make sure 
that it's clear that you are fully dedicated to the venture, uh, that it's not just a try and error for you, that you will fight for it. If you have examples how you fought for it already, it will be great. Um, and what could some of those examples be that show I fought for my venture? We lost our um, biggest client. It depends on what stage the company are, but let's say uh, they are, they are having already customers or pilot customers, design partners. We lost our biggest partner. We lost our biggest uh, paying customer, which will happen, by the way, to any startup one day. Um, and we it take us it took us a week to rewire our, our product. We spent two nights writing uh, hundreds of, of, of lines of code, and we pivoted to the second client that we had in the pipeline, and flew to the vacation site of the CEO and pitched them our product and why they have to. Take it. So you're creative, you're goal oriented, you are not afraid of crisis, you are dedicated. Okay. And then what are some other maybe lessons you've learned from your experience in psychology and human behavior that you could apply to that to the entire fundraising process? Because that's fascinating and you know, what are some maybe tips and just tactics that a founder can take away from those experiences you've had as a psychologist? So uh, humans decide 99% of the decisions automatically. We like to think that we are rational and we invest a lot of thinking and we have very, very powerful experience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. By the end of the day, most of our decisions would be made automatically with what psychologists called system one thinking. And the automatic decisions, they are very dependent on uh, various clues in the situation. So if you, if you prepared, if you know how to use, to design those clues in the situation of the pitch, your chances are much bigger. On the second meeting, when it's not just a decision of yes or no, you will have to address the rational part of the cell. But on the beginning, it's always automatic thinking covered by some process. So those clues may be anchoring, Anchoring means that when you show some numbers, they are meaningless if you don't show something to compare with. So, for instance, if you are saying my market is $2 billion, nobody can imagine $2 billion. Even your investor who may have those $2 billion, it's very, very hard for humans to imagine $2 billion. So, you have to give some kind of anchor so the number will be meaningful. The same about the amount of people that work in the company, which is easier, but again, still, it's good to give anchors. Prices, you should compare how much it costs for you compared to your competitors, not just because you have to know your competitors, because the other person needs anchors to, to transform the numbers into something meaningful. So anchor, it's a one very, very powerful tool. If you're looking for it, so just type anchoring and you will find a lot of uh, literature about it. Uh, actually, there is a Nobel Prize won for anchoring, partly for anchoring and another free effects. So this is a great tool. Um, another one, again, from the psychological toolbox, uh, will be social proof. So in a very, very... A uh, brief uh, description, uh, social proof, it's our tendency, homo sapiens, so every human, we have tendency to follow actions, the actions of people who are similar to us. That's a general tendency. 
It was a very useful evolution from evolutionary standpoint thousands years ago, and it's the same software that we are um, carrying today. So if you can provide uh, signals of social proof, that's a great, great tool. What I mean when I'm saying social proof, investors that are similar to the investor that you are meeting, similar in the uh, size of the phone, similar in the uh, geography that they are located in, uh, similar in the interests, similar in the background, as, as similar as it gets, your chances are bigger. And you are telling that they are very confident about the startup. Maybe they are even put put in money in it. Maybe they gave you advice. Maybe you can put them in the board of directors or just advisory board or something. That's one kind of social proof, very powerful. Don't lie, be honest, but don't forget to use those pieces of data. Other kind of social proof, it's, uh, it's more uh, product wise social proof when you show that uh, other companies follow the same path, that the market are searching now for uh, that kind of solutions, that the last article in Wall Street Journal about the next challenge was about. So you are giving signals of social proof about the market, about the product. Either, either it's a very, very, very powerful tool. So anchoring social proof, but don't be manipulative. Be honest. Just don't forget to package your message in the right way. That's absolutely amazing. And, and that's going to get clipped right away. One of the things that founders face, and I've personally seen this as a trend, is you know, bootstrapping versus fundraising. And bootstrapping has become a bit more famous. It's become a bit more of a trend where people talk about it. And you've had a couple of really you know big success stories that everyone's aware of. What would you say are some signals to look for? When, or how do you know when it's time to try and go to investors? Versus how do you know when it's time to just focus on your product and just bootstrap things? When can you make the distinction? So uh, there are different approaches. My personal, don't risk your money. You are not investor. Uh, most of the people who bootstrap these startups, they would never, never buy a stock of, of a very risky company. But somehow they feel comfortable putting their own money in their company. So there are, of course, psychological biases that support such a behavior. But my opinion, don't, don't risk your money. Um, like everything in the world, it's a profession. It's, it requires expertise. It requires the diversification, etc., etc. So use investors' money. If you're going to succeed, it doesn't matter. You will have enough money for everyone. If you're going to fail... Don't waste the time. Just learn from the experience and don't waste your time of, and your energy and your uh, nerves on, on bootstrapping your company. So my point of view, don't risk your money at, 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 unless you have money to risk. So does that mean, it, you know, as soon as you begin, you're getting some traction, it is worth trying to go and fundraise and find somewhere that you can finance your product with? Yes, definitely. And it's not just because of the risk of the money. As, as earlier you get into the ecosystem, you get investors knowing you, you may, you're meeting other entrepreneurs, um, you became stronger and stronger because by the end of the day, it's not just pure product. It's the network, it's the relationship, it's the one investor telling to another one that he met interesting company that may fit his portfolio. Uh, it's a co-investment of a couple of investors. So it's not just because of the money. Definitely don't risk your money, but it's also very healthy to be part of the conversation uh, because it, it provides a lot of benefits. Of course, there are investors and there are stories of... of uh, you know, terrible terms, etc., etc. 
that's that's a general uh, suggestion. Don't let fool yourself in in the negotiation. Get good advisors. Get good legal advisors. Get good uh, financial advisors because you probably don't understand the finance and the legal terms. Uh, but that's a general thing. It has nothing to do with the st- what stage should you approach the investors. Alex, I want to. The last question I want to ask you is. You mentioned the Valley is going through some hard days right now, and some of its best days might actually be behind it, unfortunately. what As an investor that's looking across the globe, I, I don't know if you travel to Asia much, uh, Eastern Asia, South Korea, China, Japan, these types of places, but as you look forward, and this is not going to be fundraising related, but I still want to kind of get your take on it. What do you think is going to emerge as, as the next kind of startup hub of the world. Do you think the U.S. and a lot of major U.S. cities are going to be able to protect that status? Or do you see other major rising stars that are going to be able to replace and and become the incumbents in, you know, 10, 20, 30 oh, years? Obviously, we don't know. Uh, if I knew, I would put all of the money in the, from the fund in you know, in uh, just of the stock of the country that I'm thinking of. But it's very hard to believe that someone will um, win the race against the states because of the mindset, because of the political ground that help to and support innovation and, and, and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, so definitely China will provide meaningful uh, competition but i don't think it will be possible for them or any other cu- culture which is a not individualistic culture which is a more um uh, eastern culture which is a very different to beat the states as a grand zero of, of innovation having said that um it's a it's a natural tendency with when some central cities or uh, central um areas of the world are declining after some time that's that's the natural way of things so you should expect of of different places to achieve their peak and then to to degrade and it's okay. It's fine. I mean, that's how the world has. That's how the the mechanics of the world work. So I don't think so, anybody gonna beat the states in the near future, but definitely gonna be competition in general from the east. Awesome. That's it for the questions I've got. Is there anything you'd like to add, Alex? Uh, first of all, I I was thinking of your first question about what city. So I was very careful not to be, you know, I'm from Israel, so I was very careful not to put the, to emphasize specific city, but I think it's worth saying for the founders, Tel Aviv, it is the place for founders. Um, there's, there's, there's only one, um, like a cone of, of thinking about Tel Aviv as your base. Uh, that the amount of the money here is smaller than the amount of the money in the valley, for instance. But the money are much smarter because every dollar spent here equals to ten dollars in the states, just because the prices are different, just because the, the, the paychecks are different. So it's worth considering. That's about Tel Aviv. And don't give up because of the no. It's just the right person on the right timing with the right product. 